Right, here we go. Fear the Walking Dead, Season 7, Episode 13. Time to watch the episode, so let's have a look at the episode synopsis. Dwight and Sherry must decide between their code and safety. Oh, Jesus Christ, this episode sounds awful. This episode is awful. Anyway, this video will contain spoilers, so without further ado, let's begin. Well, that certainly was an episode of Fear the Walking Dead. Once again, it's full of horrendous writing, which is going to come as a surprise to absolutely no one. But one thing which I absolutely loved about this episode is the scene which takes place at around the 15 minute 13 mark, which for me just perfectly sums up this show. So in said scene, Morgan is walking around in the middle of nowhere and he then encounters Alicia, who appears out of nowhere, and he says to Alicia, how did you get here and where did you come from? To which she doesn't reply. She just stares at Morgan in dead silence until he moves on to talking about something else. And it's just amazing because this is what happens on the show every week. Characters appear in random locations, characters bump into characters in the middle of nowhere when really they shouldn't, and the show offers no explanation. And it does the same here, except it's a character refusing to tell us where she came from. It's amazing. It's almost like the writers are self-aware now. This scene is just incredible. And what makes this scene even better is that after Morgan talks about something else, Alicia then starts talking about how she found a transmitter off screen. So in this scene, you've got a character bumping into another character in the middle of nowhere. The other character then doesn't explain where they've even come from or how they got there before they then start talking about something they did off screen. It's phenomenal. Like this just sums up everything about this show. This is a perfect representation of Fear the Walking Dead season seven. It's amazing. This truly is some top tier writing, ladies and gentlemen. I honestly think that this scene should be shown in creative writing classes around the globe because why waste time explaining things? Why waste time even having stuff happen on screen? That method of writing is so outdated nowadays. Move out of the way, Citizen Kane, because Fear the Walking Dead is the new Citizen Kane. This truly is Chamberlain and Goldberg's world, and we are just tiny, insignificant ants living in it. I want you all just to take a brief moment now and think about how amazing the world could be, how more incredible this world that we live in could be if we could all emulate the writing styles of the writers on Fear the Walking Dead, if we could all master this amazing technique, it would increase your writing productivity by 10,000%. Honestly, Fear the Walking Dead's writers, they could write the final book in the Ice and Fire series in one day. I mean, look at the size of these books. George R. R. Martin, what are you doing? Think how many trees have died for your pointless explanations and stories and your pointless plots. We don't need this, George R. R. Martin. More like George R. R. You an idiot! What are you doing, man? You could learn a thing or two from these absolute genius showrunners that helm this beautiful show. I certainly have learned a lot from these two. In fact, I've learned so much from their genius techniques that I've now completely changed the way I approach my videos. I now completely changed the way that I write my scripts. So what you're looking at now on screen, ladies and gentlemen, is my version one script of my Dead in the Water video. And just look at that word count. 1600 words? Who needs 1600 words to explain anything? What the hell was I thinking? Now this, this is a script. Look at it. Look how beautiful it is. I don't need to explain anything to the audience because the audience will work it out themselves. And that's the problem with most modern showrunners nowadays. That's the problem. They don't trust the audience. They think you're stupid. But Chambers and Goldberg, they trust you completely. They know that your 200 IQ brains don't need anything explaining to you because you can work it out. They know that you're sat there at home and that you've got a complex algorithm which can work out everything that has already happened in Fear the Walking Dead and everything that will come to happen. They respect your intelligence. Chambers and Goldberg know that you've done the maths. They know that you know and that you don't need to know because you already know. So you don't need to know what they know because you know. It's a well-known fact that Fear the Walking Dead is much loved by those of a higher intellect. It's absolutely true. Stephen Hawking, he loved the show. He wrote many books about it. He wrote many books which tried to explain the complex nature of the show. I mean, his book, Brief Answers to Big Questions, is exactly that. It's him trying to explain everything for those whose minds aren't as clever as Fear the Walking Dead's viewers. He loved the show. And if you don't believe me, well, this clip here, which shows his last words before he died, will show just how much he loved Fear the Walking Dead. All I wanted was to live long enough to see the end of a fantastic fear the walking dead. Why is the universe so cruel? You know what it is. I lose people, then I lose myself. And that's not all, because the Bible, the Christian Bible even states that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said to his God, he said, Father, Father, forgive them, 
Forgive those who dislike Fear the Walking Dead, for they do not understand that Chambliss and Goldberg are your true messiahs. Did you know that the final secret text in the Church of Scientology is only accessible to those who either donate 10 million US dollars to the church or to those who watch Fear the Walking Dead season 4 to 7 100 times? Strangely, most people choose to donate the money. But anyway, the final secret text in the church is actually, it's, it's everything. It's a, the meaning of life, which Andrew Chambers wrote when he was five years old on a single piece of toilet paper, ladies and gentlemen. A single piece was all he needed to explain the intricacies of the universe. And the text itself is so deceptively simple, yet undeniably transcendent. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, at the age of five years old, Andrew Chambers wrote down the meaning of life on a single piece of toilet paper. And what's even more impressive is that he did this whilst only using 20 characters and whilst only using the letters Q, Z and Y. Also, did you know that? I've got, I've got nothing else, that's it, I'm done. You'll be glad to know I'm done. The show is actually driving me insane. Right, let's actually get back to talking about the episode. Let's carry on. So this episode mainly focuses on two different pairs of characters. We have Morgan and Alicia as one pair, and then we have Dwighty Boy and Sherry as the other. And I'll carry on talking about Morgan and Alicia now because I've already mentioned them in this review already. So Morgan has decided that he's going to lead all the walkers away from Strand's Tower because he believes that will make it easier to attack Strand's Tower. If they're all away, they can just launch their attack and get in there. Which kind of is very disrespectful to John's sacrifice in the last episode because John killed himself to prevent the walkers from following Morgan. And in this episode, Morgan is just like, yeah, fuck you, John. I'm going to get the walkers to follow me anyway. So, so what, what was the point? Anyway, later on in this episode, Morgan basically tries to blackmail Alicia into attacking the tower. He says to Alicia, oh, if we don't attack tonight, then I'm, I'm going to go. For some reason, I don't know. But he's like, yeah, if we don't attack now, I'm going to go. Which causes Alicia to get very upset. I don't know why Alicia is so attached to Morgan, why she cares about Morgan so much. I mean, based on this episode, you would think that these two are lovers. I don't understand why she's getting so upset about Morgan saying he's going to go. Who gives a fuck? Let him go. After spending the entire episode trying to convince Alicia to attack the tower, she finally agrees that they should attack the tower, at which point Morgan's like, yeah, I'm out of here. Like, they finally agree to attack the tower, which is his idea, by the way, and he's like, yep, I'm now leaving on a boat. I am now going on a boat. I'm running away. What the fuck is going on? What is going on? He takes uh, baby Mo away because he's like, oh, uh, Grace said it would be safer for her. What? It would be safer for her on a boat? Going going where on a boat? On, on the, You think it's going to be safe on this little shitty boat that you have as opposed to her staying in the tower? She was safer where she was. What? Anyway, saving Grace is that it looks like Morgan might be gone from the show for now for at least a couple of episodes. Thank Christ for that. I do love how, like, the season seven posters... It has, like, Morgan and Strand screaming at each other, like, teasing these two fighting. And now we finally got to the war, and Morgan's just pissed off. Amazing. Apparently there's now a radiation leak on the submarine, which means the characters can't live there anymore, which is very convenient, because it gives them more reason to want to attack the tower and take it over, because they can't live in their sub. And, uh, yeah, Alicia now can't go back to the sub to use her transmitter. So she says, right, it's okay, I'll, I'll use the transmitter on Strand's roof. But I don't understand because I thought the entire point of her using the transmitter in the first place was to send out a radio message to try and get people to join her to attack Strand's tower. But if she's already managed to gain access to Strand's tower and is doing it on the roof, it doesn't really make any sense. It, like That means it's either going to be one or two scenarios. Number one, if she's already they've already taken over the tower, at which point why do you need to go on the roof and ask for people to join you? I don't know. Maybe they still want people to join them. I, I don't know. Or, you know, scenario two is that is she going to just sneak up to Strand's tower and then be like, I'm at Strand's tower. Uh, I need you to, to help me attack the tower. Come now. Whilst everyone there has their walkies and can hear it. I don't know. What is the point of the transmitter? What does she need this for? Have I got the complete wrong end of the stick? Is it something else entirely? I don't know. But I thought the entire point of the transmitter was to get hold of people to join her. But now she wants to do it at the, at the place. She wants to use the transmitter at the place that she wants to attack. I don't understand. So anyway, let's move on to Dwight and Sherry. Now, when these two reunited back in season six of Fear the Walking Dead, I was happy. You know, it was a nice scene of them two getting back together. And I was looking forward to, you know, having this uh, this couple reunite and, uh, you know, for them to be uh, have been a nice relationship. But since that point, they've honestly become, for me, the most annoying couple 
in the entire Walking Dead universe because all they do is squabble and fight about pointless shit every fucking episode. It's so tedious. I just can't stand these two. They really get on my nerves, which is a shame because I really used to like Dwight on The Walking Dead. But yeah, these two as a couple, they just go round in circles. Their dialogue just goes round in circles all the time. And the dialogue that Dwight has in particular is awful. I mean, Sherry's isn't much better, but Dwight has some really bad lines this episode. So here's a couple of examples. We got a code, Sherry. We can't go against our code. I'm trying to show her a reason to stay alive. I don't want to turn into the person you don't want me to be. Yeah, this dialogue is just exhausting. Dwight and Sherry bump into Wes three times, I believe, this episode, who's trying to retrieve baby Mo from them. And Wes is now Howard. He's transformed into Howard because, like Howard, he can also just teleport across the Walking Dead's universe, across, you know, Fear's world, and just end up exactly where the plot needs him. And like Howard, he's also fucking useless and it's just getting completely owned by the protagonist every time he's on screen. So the first time he's on screen, he's on his horse and so are Dwight and Sherry. And, you know, he says, oh, you can't kill me because of your code. So then Sherry, like, shoots the floor, which, which like, uh, spooks his horse, which throws him off the horse. And then he just spends, like, the next five minutes on the floor holding his leg, like, uh, 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 uh. That's what he does. He spends five minutes on the floor crying about his bruised knee. And while Sherry and Dwight just get away. What was going on? This is so embarrassing. And then the second time he encounters Dwight and Sherry, he's with his rangers. And Dwight, like, causes a distraction and he takes out a couple of the rangers. And then he pins Wes to the floor. And he says to Sherry, go, Sherry, run, run. And then the next time we see these two characters, Dwight and Sherry are together. And Wes is nowhere to be seen. It doesn't explain what happened. It doesn't explain how they got to this new place. It doesn't explain what happened between Wes and Dwight. Did they? What happened, you know, between the fight with them? It, it just jumps forward. It's just, it's just amazing. Oh, man. This show is just fucking awful. Dwight and Sherry then just so happen to stumble upon the location of Teddy's bunker. And they then get in contact with... Morgan and uh, Alicia via their radio which kind of makes me question the need for Alicia's transmitter anyway in the first place because these radios just seem to work over ridiculous distances so why why do you even need the transmitter and yeah they ask where the bunker is and they're like oh you're right on top of the bunker how convenient so then they decide to hide in the bunker I think Dwight and Sherry decide to hide in there because the rangers are near them I don't know I wasn't really paying attention at this point if I'm honest and then Morgan and, and uh, Alicia decide to lead all the walkers into the bunker to get rid of them. So what happens next is that Dwight and Sherry decide to crawl through the tunnels. They decide to crawl through the same tunnel which collapsed on Alicia. And because of, I guess, all the walkers are in the area and standing on top of the area where the bunker is, it causes another cave-in. And then, uh, you know, Dwight, Dwight tries moving some, some bits of uh, the brick or whatever it is, tries moving some of the rubble. And he's just like, oh, well, we're stuck. And I was just thinking, really? You're just going to give up? You know, he's just accepting death. He tries to move like one bit of rubble and he's like, nope, we're stuck. Looks like we're just going to die here. Yeah, nice one, Dwight. But then Sherry decides to do a pregnancy test, which comes back as positive, And this gives them the strength and the motivation they need to move the rubble. What I found funny as well is that they, after they exit the cave, I think Morgan says, oh, like, how did you get out or something? And Dwight was like, oh, it wasn't me, it was her. Like, pointing to Sherry. Like, a yeah, nice one, Dwight. Get your pregnant wife to move all the rubble, you fucking lazy bastard. Daniel is also in this episode, in a blink and you'll miss it appearance. He randomly appears at the end of the episode, looking like a British judge. I don't know what get-up he's wearing here. What the hell is going on? What is he wearing? Who knows? And uh, also, Trucker Lady is, is in this episode as well. She appears and has, like, one line. Honestly, I forgot that she was still even in this show, to be honest. And also, Dwight and Sherry encounter a random stranger at the start of the episode who says that she's just arrived on land from the water. So I'm guessing that she maybe is from Padre, and maybe Padre is on the water and it's actually Madison's group, or maybe she's just maybe it's maybe it's different to Padre, maybe she's just from Madison's group. And I guess that Morgan is going to find uh, Madison whilst he's on his little travels on his boat. He's going to run into her. And, um, you know what I'd love? I'd love if he bumped into Madison and she just fucking shot him. That would be incredible. 
He just turns up, bumps into Madison, she shoots him. That that would be phenomenal, but it's not going to happen, of course. But that's about it. Yeah, that's about all I want to talk about this episode. I really can't be bothered to talk about it in any more detail. It's just so bad. It was just an absolute bore fest, but at least next week we might finally be getting some action. But yeah, I, I just thought this was absolute trash. Absolutely terrible. So let me know your thoughts below. What did you think? Did you agree with me? Or are you one of these 200 IQ you know, geniuses who can, can see what I'm not seeing? And, and maybe you did like this episode. Whatever your thoughts are, let me know and I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. I whacked myself in the face then. Bye.